Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is weather forecasting sites for amateur astronomers. And our guest to fill us in on this interesting topic is Blake Nancaro, a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. He's the current chair of the National Visual Observing Committee and coordinator for software training for RASC members. So Blake, weather is very important for amateur astronomers. What is a piece of old technology that you think is especially useful? Thanks for having me, Don. Uh, uh, if I could only have one piece of equipment to use for astronomy, uh, I think it would be the old classic analog barometer, which uh, I'm showing uh, an image of here. Uh, I don't know if people still have these um, or, or are familiar with how to use these, but the uh, dial on a barometer indicates if the pressure is low, um, average, or high. And generally, when you have high pressure, you, you have good weather. So it's nice and sunny, clear skies, and things like that. Uh, but um, watching the trend on a barometer can, can be really important. So that's what um, the goal sort of needle is. If you can make it out in this image, that there's the black needle, that's the current pressure, but you set the gold needle, that's a movable one, you, you set it to what the pressure is now. And, and then you go look at it an hour or two later, or a, a half a day later, or something like that, and you can see if the pressure is rising or falling. So if pressure is falling, that means bad weather is coming. And if the pressure is rising, that means good weather is headed your ways. So it, it's an amazingly useful instrument. So if you regularly monitor it, uh, it, it can be quite useful. Now that doesn't tell us about other things that astronomers are really interested in. Uh, we have special needs, of course, like we want to know the transparency of the air. We want to know the scene conditions uh, uh, of the air, uh, of course, during nighttime conditions. Exactly. Now, it is a very useful piece of equipment, but couldn't us amateur astronomers just look at the weather forecasts on TV and our smartphones? Uh, you could, but I think that the uh, information that we get from the the nightly news, the six o'clock or the eleven o'clock news, is is not really useful for amateur astronomers. When they say that it's going to be clear, that just means it's not going to rain. <laughs> so that, true. That doesn't give that doesn't give us amateur astronomers that really important information. Like again, what, what's going to be the transparency of the air and what's going to be the steadiness or the seeing of the air. Your app on your smartphone probably is similar. The generic app that tells you your weather just tells you if you need an umbrella or not. So um, the nightly news, the, the it, quick information from our smartphones or tablets is not really sort of a appropriate. Um, and, and again, it's often sort of tuned or tailored to uh, daytime use, not so much nighttime use. Um, some weather sites will tell you what's going on in the evening um, on an hour by hour basis. Um, so that that can be useful, but it, you gotta be pretty choosy um, about what what you're sort of looking for. Okay, so if we really have to take the weather reports on TV and our phones with uh, a grain of salt or two, uh, what weather tools do you use? Uh, there, uh, I, I like how you ask that, plural form, because it's not just one. I use, I use multiple tools. So, so let me show you a few of them that, that I use on a pretty regular basis. 
and some amateur astronomers may be familiar with some of these tools already. But, uh, probably one of the most popular ones is the clear sky charts. And I'm, I'm proud to say that this is a Canadian product. It's derived from data that's collected by and managed by Environment Canada. And Environment Canada specifically measures some things that are suited to astronomy. They, they measure and try to predict sky transparency and they measure and try to predict the scene conditions. So we get all that information in a clear sky chart. There's a cloud cover row. So that's a prediction of uh, obviously how much cloud is expected uh, uh, during a time period. There's transparency in seeing rows. And then there's a darkness row as well. I'm showing the full chart and the mini chart if you're looking at just the mini chart on a club or an astronomy group's website, you, you just get a little bit of information, the cloud cover and the transparency. But usually you can click on those mini charts and get the full chart. The bottom part of the chart also tells us about other things like how windy it's going to be, what the humidity is going to be like, and, and temperature. What's missing though, and one of my favorite things, about weather is is the barometer. So that's one thing that I kind of miss or don't like about the clear sky charts. Uh, the clear sky charts, if you click on one of the little blocks, it, it'll pull a map in some cases. You can animate those maps to see what's going on. Um, if um, a clear sky chart is sponsored by a an astronomy club or an individual or a company, it opens up some additional features. Uh, the European cloud cover model data is integrated into a chart. You can also access historical chart and also get um, uh, uh, climate sort of information um, as well. The quick way to read a clear sky chart is dark blue is good and white is bad. So you're looking for dark blue colors, ideally, in your cloud cover, your transparency, and your seeing rows. And this time of year, there could be the factor of smoke as well from forest fires. Uh, I have some information later uh, about that. If you're looking for the, the Clear Sky Chart website, it's pretty easy to get to it, um, www.clear darksky.com. You can see I've noted a couple of specific locations like the Ford Amateur site specifically um, and Seven Ponds and so on. And the Beckstrom Observatory, that might be one you want to look at because that's an example of a sponsored chart. So again, a couple of additional features are opened up with those. There is an app available, um, specifically one that's suited for the uh, iPhone or iOS um, platform. Uh, I don't know of a specific app for the Android platform, but certainly you could view a web page in a browser uh, uh, on your any, any smartphone and be able to get that information. So that in a nutshell is the clear sky chart. Um, it's pretty nice. Lots of locations across Canada, um, lots of locations for the US over 6,400 locations are available in total. So it's pretty impressive, again. Uh, now, by itself, the clear sky charts don't uh, show or, or don't notify you of uh, good conditions that are coming. But there's a tool that I use in conjunction with the clear sky charts. It's by a different party, a different person. It's the clear sky alarm clock. And what I've done is I have programmed in four or five profiles, which are based on a location. And then I've told it my parameters. Uh, the observatory that I like to go to that's at a dark sky site, it's a few hours away. So it's gotta be worth it um, for me to go that far, to drive that distance. So uh, 
I have fairly strict parameters there. I want really transparent skies and good scene conditions for it to be worth the drive. But I've also got a profile for my backyard and and for uh, an observatory in the city. So so that's really nice. I'll I'll get email notifications sometimes a few times a day uh, that tell me that the skies are going to be good in a particular location according to those profiles. So I I use the two together. The email alerts make me go look at the clear sky chart and I'll sort of do my analysis. Now, as I mentioned, the clear sky chart doesn't include everything like barometric pressure. So if that's really important to you, if you wanted to use that, you might need to use another tool or a regular website or your barometer at home. But here's another uh, web resource that I regularly use and consult in conjunction with the clear sky charts. I use clear outside. Now this is made by the, or provided by the first light optics company, which is a, an astronomy telescope vendor in the UK. Uh, so you might think, oh, across the pond, the, you know, the weather is not going to be accurate and so on, but they do use lo local resources where, where possible. What I really like about the clear outside, um, is the really rapid way that you can read it or interpret it. it it's kind of like traffic lights. Red is bad. Green is good. So you can see on the first row there on the 15th, it's looking like it's not going to be good conditions for the entire evening. Look, those charts are centered on midnight right now. You can change that. Uh, but on the 16th, on that next night, looks like it's clear the whole evening. And that's that's looking really good. And you can tell by the, the little bars underneath these paint chips, the red and the green paint chips, what the sunlight uh, impact is and what the moon phase is. You can also see there's a moon phase indicator on the left with a percentage number as well. So quick high level indicator um, of what it's gonna be like day by day and then hour by hour. And you can see this goes out seven days. Now, of course, the further into the future you go with respect to weather predictions, it's sort of more guessometrics. We don't really know what's going to happen. But the next two or three days are probably pretty accurate. Uh, so I, I like the seven day outlook here, although I'll take that with a grain of salt. Now, if you click on one of those days, the chart expands out and you, you get a lot more information. Uh, clearoutside.com is where you go to get specific uh, information and you can program in uh, or enter in locations and then bookmark those specifically or build links to those. There is an app, a very nice app on the uh, both the iOS and the Android platforms uh, and um, you can see I have an expanded view here so it's showing when you do open up one of the days that you get a breakdown by cloud cover, low, medium, and high cloud. You get visibility, uh, precipitation predictions, the wind, uh, the temperature, the dew point, and it's not shown in this image, but you also get the air pressure. So I'll look at if the air pressure is increasing or decreasing over time. So I, I quite like that app. The clear outside is just simply another tool that I use um, at the same time. A relative newcomer to the uh, astro astronomy weather prediction tools, and, and it's quite a popular one now, is Astrospheric. There are elements of Astrospheric that are very similar to the initial one that we looked at, the clear sky charts. Um, in that we see cloud cover, transparency, and scene conditions. Those are the prominent rows at the very top of this. But there's also indication of sunlight and moonlight, these sinusoidal lines. Uh, uh, there's air temperature and dew point. When the air temperature drops, you can see in the graph, and gets close to the dew point, you got to fire up your dew heaters, uh, of course, to keep um, moisture at bay. You can click on any one of those time slots and the top part of the page changes. It shows you the cloud cover that's gonna be happening at that particular time. 
you can enter in or store locations um, with it. There, this is a freemium or a premium kind of product, so you can pay money and it unlocks additional features. The uh, Astrospheric also goes out many days into the future. You're not limited to three. Um, you can get about eight or nine uh, days into the future. So quite a good tool here, similar in a lot of ways to uh, the Clear Sky Charts. A couple of unique features, uh, they now show a KP index. So if you're a Aurora hunting, um, you can keep an eye on the predicted KP index value. And there's also an indication of International Space Station flyovers that will appear in Astrosphere. Once again, there's good um, apps. So head to astrospheric.com um, to load up the website. And again, for iOS and Android, there's quite a nice app that, that's available that can be used. Uh, another one of the websites that I use is good to stargaze. And this is a bit like clear outside in that it's got a very quick, easy to read indicator. Red is bad. Don't bother going out. But green is good. Fire up the telescope. What's very unique about good to stargaze is you can easily control the parameters or filters that are important to you. If there's a minimum temperature that you're prepared to observe at, you can set that as a limit. And when that limit is, uh, uh, you fall below that limit, then the indicator goes red. And as soon as there's one red indicator in the various criteria for each day and hour, then that triggers the overall right-hand column. Uh, so you can set limits for temperature, for humidity, for cloud cover, for moonlight, and other, other factors. So it's really interesting in that respect in that you can tune it to how for how you like to observe. Now that is uh, really uh, quite interesting, Blake. I like the great number of uh, apps and resources that are available. Uh, but right now we do have to take a quick break. Uh, if any of our viewers uh, have a question, uh, please send us an email. Uh, we'll put the uh, address down at the, the bottom of your screen. And coming up next with Term of the Month is Stephen. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is Space Weather. Space Weather is a branch of space physics, aeronomy, heliophysics. It is concerned with conditions in the solar system, including the solar wind. Around Earth, it considers the magnetosphere, the ionosphere, the thermosphere, and exosphere. Amateur astronomers can get aurora alerts via text messages and other means. For example, the app just recently mentioned, Astrospherics. And that's the term of the month, space weather. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen. We're back with our guest, Blake Nankauer from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Now, Blake, I understand there's one more tool that you'd like to tell our viewers about. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, in fact, this is a, a, a US-based product. Uh, I regularly visit the Aviation Center, which is provided by NOAA, uh, the National Weather Service. And this can be shown in black and white, it can be shown in infrared, a couple of other uh, formats, and it can be animated. So what's really useful there is you can see cloud coming in from the west. So you can set it up for any location in the continental US. It works for me uh, in Ontario uh, as well. I base it on the, the Detroit location. So I watch weather coming from the west. Generally weather prevails over North America from west to east. So watch what's coming off in the West, and that can be very informative. Um, so all of the tools that I've shown you, uh, they have great features, but not, not one tool kind of does it all. So this table here summarizes all, all of the tools. 
clear sky charts, clear outside, and so on. And and there's lots of green check marks there. But th this is why I use more than one tool so that I can gather information from multiple sources and sort of make an informed decision. Uh, but they're all they're all sort of good and they work well together. It, it looks that way with a number of different sources. You can really make the best possible decision. Now, earlier you mentioned about smoke from wildfires. Uh, obviously, this is a big problem in, in North America. How does that affect uh, observing? In general, when there's smoke uh, uh, that's, that's uh, in the air, that's adding particulate to the air, and that affects then transparency. So um, what, what we want to do then is use our tools, but take that into account. So the clear sky charts will show you a warning, that red bar at the bottom is saying, hey, there's smoke in the area. So you kind of have to mentally subtract from the transparency, that the transparency will be eroded a bit. Some of the tools like Astrospheric, they integrate that in. They, they do the math for you. They show you the adjusted transparency. Okay. Now you can look. You can look directly at what's going on with forest fires in North America. There's a Canadian product called FiresmokeCA, and you can use a U.S. tool as well, uh, HMS uh, mapping system. So both of those tools are animated. They show the intensity of the smoke in your area. So then you you can sort of fa factor that in. You might have beautiful clear skies, uh, but if there's smoke moving into the area and you're galaxy hunting, that's going to affect your transparency. Absolutely. Now, in about the minute that we have left, this has been a great show. Um, is it possible to design and build your own weather portal? It is. Um, if you're good with HTML. Uh, if you know how to design a web page and do a little bit of coding, then you, you might build your own page. So what I'm showing here is a snapshot of a portal that I made, and it's got the mini versions of the clear sky charts, mini versions of clear outside, um, Environment Canada, uh, little uh, snippets for my location, the ovation for the Aurora Oval, plus other things. So. So if you, yeah, you're good at coding or hacking um, and no HTML, you can make your own page, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Blake, I wanna thank you very much for being our guest uh, on the show this month. It's been some great information. Uh, if folks would like more information, you can uh, visit the club website. Uh, the address, as always, is down at the bottom of your screen. And to finish out the show, we'll have Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Don. What's Up in the Night Sky for August 2022? The days are getting shorter pretty fast in August in the Northern Hemisphere, and of course longer they move fast in the Southern Hemisphere. The moons start with the first quarter on August 5th. The full moon is on the 11th. The last quarter is on the 19th. The new moon is on the 27th. Uh, then we have Mercury all by itself. Mercury goes from Leo to Virgo over the month and sets soon after sunset. Here on the 27th, Mercury has maximum elongation farthest from the sun and should be easiest to see. You might catch the moon setting if you're there early enough. Then we have the, all of the other planets. The planets cover the whole sky this month in a line in the morning. This is just before sunrise on the 1st. Venus goes from Gemini to Leo. Uranus is in Aries. Mars goes from Aries to Taurus. Jupiter is in Cetus, rising before midnight. Neptune goes from Pisces to Aquarius, rising a bit earlier. Saturn is in Capricornus and has opposition on the 14th. Pluto is just to the right of Saturn off the screen uh, in this image near the horizon in this image. So the uh, view here is not a straight line, it's a big curve thing, and you're practically at the horizon by Saturn. Um, so Pluto just had opposition in July, 
and so is uh, best likely uh, uh, around midnight. Uh, note that Uranus and Mars are really quite close to each other. They might be in a field of view. Um, and then we have a comet. Comet uh, C 2017 K2 Pan Stars is magnitude 8.4, so it's not quite naked eye, but it may be binocular, uh, from a binocular object from a dark sky site. It moves from Ophiuchus to Scorpius over the month, following the vertical red straight line. We're showing the sky here on the 14th at about 10 p.m. And that's what's up in the night sky for 2022. Now, we don't charge money for this show, but we may tax your brain. Thank you.